we may start recording. So, Paul, thanks very much for giving me your time, mate. I do appreciate it. Um, I know it's an, an area you're, you're not comfortable um, talking about very often, but it's something that played an enormous part in your life um, was when you went to watch Bradford play on the 11th of May in 1985. They were about to get the trophy for winning the third division. And then it all went horribly wrong. And for that point within your life, there were serious issues where you were worried that, you know, where was your dad? Flames were coming up. You were obviously conflicted at that point. Do I jump the wall? Do I try and get down and get my dad? Do I don't know where he is? If I try and find him, will I find him? Do I stay put and he might get me? And it all came to a head with, as you said, your dad, you know, basically going, move. And that, that was obviously, that age in your life when you were young had huge implications. No one would want to experience what you experienced. But you've, you know, grown, uh, you know, remarkably. You've had a magnificent life that some of us weren't lucky to have. They obviously passed away in that. You've maximised what you've done. You remember people who have been lost through your art, which I think is incredible. I mean, I think it's amazing that, you know, recognizing 56 lost souls in the work that you do is just a phenomenal you know piece for me and a lot of it is you know representative of a stadium builder that is my absolute hero so if you wouldn't mind just telling me a little bit about that background itself in your words what what went on that day what your passion about is for stadiums your passion for art and for representing you know your city um, through your art and other towns and other grounds, if you wouldn't mind giving me a wee bit of an insight, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, sure. I mean, <clears throat> going back to the, the disaster at Valley Parade, um, yes, a, an horrible event, uh, one that obviously has shaped part of my life. I wouldn't say it's you know there was a big um, a big media push on the 30th anniversary, which we've spoken about before. Uh, where I was targeted by broadsheet newspapers because of what, what I was doing. Somehow they got um, the, the local TNA got hold of the story. Um, and the, the, the term therapy, yeah, it is a therapy, but it's not, you know, it, people talk about the disaster in, in various different ways from different angles. Um, and it, you know, it, as, as traumatic as it was that day, um, my interest towards football stadium started about five years previous to that. Um, as you can see behind me, we spoke previously about the Bradford Park Avenue site and the stadium that I'm painting at the moment. Um, in 1980, the ground was demolished, um, and I was lucky enough to, to get inside the old stadium just literally a few months before it came down. Um, and the vision of that main stand um, with the three gables, and, and obviously seeing it from the cricket side as well, which just made so much of an impression on myself uh, that I started drawing on not painting at that time but just drawing with pens bido pens or anything I could get the hands on and fixtures away watching Rapid City away with my father Barry um, maybe creating the old match scene or a goal scene with an old stand in the background that's where it you know, started but you know this disaster yeah it's still there today you still think about it you still, you think about the people that have been less fortunate but I'm fortunate enough that I can put um, the experiences or the feelings of, of that day back into the the pictures that I've paid. No, and that, that's the thing I, I did recognise and it was something I was keen to talk about because I absolutely love the, the painting Broken Souls and I know that you, you at that point it was trying to uh, get in touch with the people who were lost, represented the city, represented the club and, and, it, and it was a, a lovely piece to, to remember them and Remembering 56 has been quite a common thread within your work, which I think has been magnificent. And raising funds for, at that time, with that, that one painting, a significant amount of money for, uh, for the Burns unit as well. You know, you've, you've come on an amazing journey with your art. And, and clearly, as you can see behind you, the stadium's, yes, iconic. Two, your work is magnificent. But... The big thing is, is the representation that I like is it's drawn you towards a love of the man who I love, who is Archibald Leach. And yes, he was involved in two grounds within your city, um, but he was involved in a whole lot more. And I know that certainly from your 
driving passion having family who were Bradford Park Avenue fans and you were taking that day you know to support Bradford City and you, know, you have now obviously covered so many of these grounds in art so can you tell me a little bit about what you've actually covered in these grounds what you've maybe found out about Archie through your work and what grounds you actually really like to put brush strokes onto canvas with? Um, I've got all of them. <laughs> uh, any time Archie's work comes up visibly within books or TV or social media, I just I get so encapsulated into the whole process. Um, and like I say, when I first saw this stamp stadium behind me, um, but obviously Archie's connection to Valley Parade, the old Midland Road stand, which was for our football club iconic. A lot of people don't know what it looked like unless they've had the, the literature to, to, to view that uh, Simon's written. Uh, previously in the photographs um, within the books, the engineering and archery books and the, the football grounds uh, of England and Wales, um, which later is a bit uh, addition of Scot Scottish grounds that are left to date. Um, but yeah, it's um, like you, we've spoken before about favourite grounds of arches, and I, for me, there's not particularly a favourite one, it's just that I find them all um, stimulating in their own, their own you know. Their own ways basically, and you know, you could talk about we spoke about the other week about the Trinity Road stand at Villa Park, um, the facade at, at Fulham's Craven Cottage, um, and then the more insular, I'd call it more insular stadiums. Um, you know, you could really look at Tyne Castle Park, where the back of the main stand was a bit, little bit less grand than the, the other structures that are actually built, so that must have been down to the, the, the club budgets or the budgets that. Archibald, you know, and his designs that he put towards the club at the time. Um, so that's where the real fascination behind Archibald Leach's work uh, comes in. Um, you know, when you look at the, the, the back of the Craven Cottage stand, it's like, how, how could you not stand there and view that almost monolithic structure? And, you know, if I get, I could go, I've never been to Craven Cottage, and that's, a, that's the alarming thing for me. It's like I've got so much to see. Um, and, Luckily, that's a listed building, and one day I, I hope to see it for, for myself. But I don't think I'd, I could probably miss the football bit out, if I was honest, and just stand there and look at the, the structure and the architecture. Yeah, and I, I, I've been lucky. I can see that's one that I've, I've ticked off. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot to be said about, you mentioned there about Archie and some of these grounds being purely functional. Because for me, I, I mentioned before, I mean, I love Tyne Castle. Uh, as it was, I always found that if somebody was to tell, ask me what my three favourite grounds were, considering I've travelled all, travelled all around the world, I always kind of get drawn back to saying I love the Mestaya because it's just there's no experience like having umpteen tiers of fans sitting on top of your head, um, and you know they, you feel like they would all want to kill you. And the Dukeip Stadium um, or the Feyenoord Stadium is, is is which is about to be lost as well is one of my other ones, but. Tyne Castle, there's something just amazing about Tyne Castle. It's not got the grandeur of um, Ibrox in Scotland, but it certainly got the intimidating atmosphere. And I think part of that was uh, projected from the fact of the wooden interior and the stand and the noise it could make. And it would, it would make the stadium seem so intimidating. It would be like extra points or an extra man in, in the pitch for them. And for me, I think that's, that's lost. Uh, now that they've got their new stand, I don't think having... The, the sort of concrete structure around it projects the, 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 the noise and it doesn't seem as intimidating and as scary as it was. But as you say, you know, Tyne Castle wasn't pretty, but that's because Archie was a salesman and he was building kit built stadiums and he was selling the dream. He was a salesman as well and he was saying, Well, if you want this ground, I will take you to, to Hillsborough and I'll show you what I've done at Sheffield um, to the, the Hearts directors. I'll sell you this dream. But when the reality came, they might have sold Percy Dawson to Blackburn Rovers um, for what that time was a hell of a lot of money, but it still didn't go far enough to pay for the whole stand. And, it's, and an that, uh, yeah, it's an interesting book, yeah. It's, it's a really interesting um, part of his work, which I've, you know, I've uncovered myself and the research behind it. Um, <clears throat> and we've spoken about club budgets. Now, you'd expect that in, in today's um, world that Liverpool would have a more grandstand than uh, or stand with more stature than maybe one at Tynecastle or, or Fulham or as, as in, we spoke about previously Trinity Road at Villa Park um, but obviously at that time Liverpool weren't a big football club they were probably a second division team uh, so the budget that they could put forward for the, 
uh, the main stand, which in some respects um, mirrored similarly the, uh, the, the stand at uh, Ayrson Park with the Battle Rue and the gable in the middle. Um, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things, that, the subject that I've, I've sort of thought about at length, you know, and I've looked at Molyneux, um, the whole st stadium thing behind Archie's work um, and the budgets, and it's always the budgets that seem to come back to my mind. It's like, why did the Bulls have a ground that, that was so grand and the, the, you know, the Molyneux stand, which <clears throat> actually is one of my favourites. Um, we've touched on, on favourite structures and stands and, and stadiums, and I, I love them all, but the, um, the Molyneux stand is one of my favourite Le Leach uh, products. Um, and then, you, you, you know, you look at the... We've spoken about Trinity Road at length previously, Rob, um, and, and how that stadium, that, well, that stand was pulled down. Um, I, I can't really describe how I feel about that one. I think it's, it's almost barbaric that a club would um, take away something so grand uh, for the for, for so-called progress. I know the, the safety comes into it, the aspect of safety, and that's a must. Uh, no one knows that more than myself, but surely something could have been done where they could have built over the top of that brickwork uh, and extended. Uh, we've got, you know, genius engineers in this in these world, this today's world, a little bit like Archie was. Um, and I think that something could have been done where that stadium could have been, or that facade of the Trinity Road stand could have been saved. Yeah, I, I've got to agree because I've mentioned, you know, in previous conversations, I mean, being the fact that I worked for Rangers, um, I, I got a sense of a club that's very attached to their history. And they're also a club that's been involved in disasters as well. And the, the learning from the disasters was obviously part of the process to make sure it's a safer fan experience. Now, whether that was recommissioning Archie after the 1902 disaster, but giving them the opportunity to fix things in concrete, steel barriers and putting in a new stand. But then, you know, exit strategies and fans and disasters still happen and it did happen. And they learned from that. They built three brand new stands to make sure that the disaster that happened would never happen again. But when they did look at the main stand for redevelopment, which was still, you know, a lot of it wooden interior, they took the strategy of we're not knocking this place down. This is an incredible piece of work. And they ended up extending into doing what they've got as a club deck, but keeping that fabric of that building. And anybody that looks at that stand looks at a work of art. They look they look at it and they see a you know a piece of beauty. It's now listed thankfully. But the internals of it are modern. You know, well this is what yeah one of the things I was going to pick up on um uh, and sort of cut in there was that you know a lot of these stands, the internal um, decor, as I'd call it, even like gangways, exits, all had a certain theme about them, but a certain lovable look, I'd say. Um, and you know, you, you we're talking about Ibrox and the, the corridors in the back of that stand. I've never, I've never been in the place. Um, I think I once peeked through the door. I was at Ibrox one, Ibrox one afternoon uh, on a visit to Scotland, and I think a club official turned up and he walked through the door and I actually got up to the door and I had a quick look through and um, that's the closest I've ever been to the inside of the stadium um, and I actually got a, a, a sort of a visual of the uh, mosaic tile floor and the staircase um, and it's just you know when you see things like that and now you know you, long bell I don't think that'd happen losing that uh, the, the standard Ibrox but you know Luckily at Tyne Castle, they've removed the mosaic floor and they've replaced it with the new. And I don't think there's enough of that. Um, we're going to say, be saying goodbye to Everton's Goodison Park shortly. Um, all being well for, for, some, for some people and for a club's progress, but will old elements of Goodison Park be taken away and incorporated into, into the new stadium? I'm not so sure. Um, I hope so. But obviously, Goodison Park was modernised in the 70s again. And the, the you know the, the biggest stand, the main stand was taken away. So really, Goodison Park, apart from the balcony walls, really isn't much left. Um, but obviously, we've still got Fulham to look at and, and admire. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting time. The legacy of Archie's work for me and, and yourself. Um, you know, I, I can keep it going up with this, the, the portraits, um, and I'm hoping I, I am hoping to release a book at some stage. 
uh, with all the grounds painted and, the, and my feelings behind uh, Archie's work and, uh, and the artistry behind it also. Yeah, and, and that's an important thing you've touched upon there within your work because having spoken to so many people, and I've mentioned before, having spoken to Craig Brown yesterday, who's a good friend of mine, he's been involved at Aberdeen in a sort of directorial level and also as an ambassador, and he's got to look at it from the sides of, one, the historical side, which he still has got a great fondness and attachment to, to the grounds, but the other side, obviously, is the, the progress and, uh, and safety and commercial activities within a ground. So it could end up being at the point where we're a couple of years or a few years away from, as you say, losing Goodison. We've only just discovered that Pataudry Aberdeen was leech. Dundee are about to celebrate 100 years of their main stands completion next year, and that might end up being one of the last years that that stands there. And it's a weird right angle bend thing, but it's still a work of art and a beauty. And it's almost going to be, is the only thing that's going to be left are pictures, memories and paintings, mm-hmm. of which this is the thing, you, you at least are delivering on the painting side. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I painted Dens Park probably two months ago for a, for a chap in Dundee. Um, you know, when you look at that stand, it was so different to anything else that, he, that Archie built. But obviously, again, we touched on the, the raising the, well, maximising the capacities and the moulding stadiums into surrounding streets. Obviously, at Dundee, Dens Park, he managed to do that with perfection. Um, it's a shame, you know, that that stand can't be pulled down and maybe put alongside a race course somewhere just to preserve uh, the, the, the thing that it did have a, that it's got a huge kink in it. Um, not sure on what degree kink, but it's, it's a, a very noticeable one. But yeah, uh, a beautiful structure. Um, and also, we've touched on small themes of Archie's work, like the columns, pillars. Um, for me, you know, I, I spend as much time looking at those elements of the stadiums, um, the Craven Cottage, the actual the, the, the balcony fencing at the cottage, the raw iron work, um, the Bradford Park Avenue behind this stand, the cricket stand we've spoke about before, um, was actually in some ways more grand than this side. You know, and you're looking at small elements of Archie's work, which a lot of people, I think a lot of people do it now, they walk around cities, you know, and look at, architectural buildings and don't actually stop and let it sink in how this was designed firstly and the men that built them you know you've got to take your hat off to these people and they, they, were, they were real craftsmen architects um and it's nowadays everything seems to be chucked chucked up and you know it's it's built in a rush but i can go on a, on a trip to manchester leeds london wherever and i can look at buildings and i can i can actually get quite emotive about it um, we spoke about the Rylands Library in Manchester and now Graham, that is inside. But for me, Archie was like that with football stadiums and it was before his time in a way. Um, and like you said before, we're losing it slightly um, and, and things are disappearing. And it's, it's really up to chaps like me and yourself to carry, carry this, uh, this theme on and, and you know, keep a, a log of his work for, for people in the future to, to enjoy. Yeah, and that, that's why it's important for me that if I can get traction with this, uh, and hopefully, I mean, there seems to be very good engagement with it so far for potential for television, but I just look at it that you can't, you can't stop progress. We know that, you know, as much as we try, and I, I'm trying to be as loyal as I can to Archie and preservation if possible, but someday the, the grounds are going to be gone. Yeah, we know we've got Craven Cottage preserved now, we know we've got Ibrox preserved, but the other grounds... They tried to put preservation on to Tynecastle, and it didn't happen, and it's gone. So they're sure the same thing's going to happen to Goodison. They might have their little legacy project. It's going to have some legs in it, but it's not going to be the, the, the ground. Um, it's not going to be dense sitting there anymore. And it's certainly for Aberdeen to make their move to Kingsford worthwhile. They know they need to get maximum amount of money from you know selling that land for housing. So yeah, the, the advent of um, you know moving on. I believe it's the time to actually do something before they're gone, and that's it. So if I can get access to get filming before you know Goodison gets pulled down, and you know get in touch with what it was like before it's gone rather than after it, then I think it's the, the right kind of timing for me, and that's why it's important for you and for me and for others to kind of get involved and see what can be done. You know, there's there's a lot of as you know on social media, there's a lot of um, sites on on football stadiums. <clears throat> I mean, I started a little page up about just 
called it a, a, a Archibald Leach, uh, Leach the work, a work of art, because that's the way I see his work. It's, it is a work of art, you know, and that, I think we are creating a sort of, sort of like a, a, I wouldn't say small cup fan club, because it's growing and growing and, ev and evolving, but Archie's work is, it's, it's getting a fan club behind it almost, yeah. and it's, you know, if you, you know, years and years ago, you could have said to you know, Archibald Leach, you know who he is. People have said no. Nowadays, you ask people, and they're, oh, is that the guy who designed the football grounds? You know, maybe one one day when I'm no longer here, people might say, oh, Paul Town, that's the guy who, who painted Archibald Leach's work or football grounds. You know, so you, we're creating fan clubs and we're creating memories and we're creating friendships through the works of Archie, which is fantastic. You know, we talked about. Um, my exhibition up at Hamden Park now, sadly, as it was a great day, it was in the modern stadium. I'd love to have been stood in the old press box on top of the stand, looking down and maybe holding an exhibition with the pigeons, but, you know, <coughs> it's... Um, don't don't I mean, take yourself, it was terrifying, mate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, 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 the museum at Hamden, they've got a replica of the old press box. I don't know if you've been, and it's actually, yeah. when you look at it, wow, you know, really impressive. Um, you know, what made a man design something like that? Um, but, you know, we've spoken before about the small elements of his work, and I think it's the small elements of his work, like the balcony walls, which will be going in here, and the, the reverse of these stands, which is so much more important than the actual larger scale product for me. And he was just a master of it. Um, you know, you've got Ibrox up previously, you know, little windows with uh, stained glass windows in between, and it just, Phenomenal, phenomenal. Yeah. And even touching on Hamden there, because I, I was very lucky to be able to, to be taken to Hamden in the days when it was in this massive, massive ball stadium. I, I was I was there the very final game before the pulled down Archie's North Stand. Unfortunately, um, Scotland lost 1-0. Uh, Paul Marner scored, and I've never forgiven him for it, even though I, I told him that um, he ruined my birthday. And he said... I'm glad I did, because he, he could appreciate playing at that ground as much as I could appreciate being there as a fan, and as much as it might have spoiled my birthday. It was a spectacle, it was a place to go, it was a massive crowd, it was a great stadium, and as much as they've, they've done work to the stadium and they've got a fantastic main stand, it's not got the same roar and aura of the stadium that it once had. Fingers crossed in the future they might do something and fix the ends and you know take it back to the the quality of the stadium that it once was, I've got to hope, because I look rather enviously down at Wembley and the Millennium Stadiums and the Aviva the Stadiums same. and Windsor Park. They're not the same, but I mean, you've touched on the North Stand there at Hamden, you know, and it's, again, a stand with a kink in it. It, it fell away to one side. When, you know, as a child, I used to watch it, the Home International on TV, and you'd view Hamden from the main stand from the camera, you'd see this stand actually looking lopsided. And I, I, would, that, I think that's where the intrigue came. It's like, why did the build stand like that? You know, I didn't know Archibald Leach was then. Mm. You know, and it's obviously when you look, you look at aerial views of the stadium, you know why. You look at the street and the kink in it behind the, behind the stand, you know, that you just, it, it just has something about it for me. It's, it's it, you know, it's, um, it gets under the skin. I tell you, there's one thing I've, I've, I've been keeping just to see whether or not you've actually looked at it already yourself, but the, 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 the thing of um, the Midland Road stand at Bradford, mm. it's supposed to be that that's, I mean, I've been, I've been there, but I couldn't even really place it from it, but it's actually been repositioned, the northern, the upper section of it's been repositioned at um, Berwick. Yeah. So it still actually, it still lives on. It might not be the, the Bradford think, City stand. Yeah, it's the the stand was trans. I think it was pulled down in 1949. Uh, the steelwork was transported by rail up to Berwick, um, Shieldfield Park. And I've actually got a, there's a picture in the. I don't know if you've seen the black and white photos, but from Steve Finnan, uh, which was uh, sent down from Scotland for me as a kind gift from a uh, a good friend of mine from Dunfermline, Kenny. Um, and there's a bit. There's actually a picture in there of the steelwork which is constructed of the old Midland Road steelwork. And it's like, the steelwork's there, nothing else. It looks a bit weird. Um, but yeah, I think it's, uh, I think the pillars are maybe there, but the lattice work in between, which actually was synonymous for, uh, that's no longer there. So it's, I think it's been chopped down and 
manipulated into something more looks more resemblance to a garden shed rather than a public <laughs> stand. <laughs> but it still lives on in some way, shape, or form. Exactly, exactly. So I'm I'm going to close by just asking you it's about one thing uh, properly. It's just to get your words on what Broken Souls was about and what it managed to do for raising funds and what it represents. Yeah, Broken Souls. Um, if I could speak about a painting that I actually can't remember painting, that's one um, which springs to mind. Uh, I said. Sometimes when I'm doing paintings, I go into my own little world or a trance or whatever, and I can spend eight hours sat in here in the studio and then wake up at four or five o'clock. Uh, that's the way it feels sometimes, but that certainly Broken Souls seemed to have that um, feeling behind it. And I ended up with a painting in front of me that I think it was just born through um, pure emotion. Um, when you look at the painting, it has just a, a northern, a typical northern street with a Bradford and Lincoln support and all the hands. Um, Lister's Mill chimney behind. It's not the painting is nothing special, but it's just I think it at the, at the time and the emotion behind the 30th anniversary. I think people um, when I put it online, people went a little bit crazy for it. So then the decision was made that we could maybe raise some funds for the Burns unit. Um, and what we did, we released 56. The 56 people lost their lives, obviously. So we released 56 uh, prints, limited edition prints for 56 pounds and we raised over three and a half thousand pounds for the Burns unit, um, which was quite humbling at the time. Um, it was great to meet the AJ, who was the, the head surgeon at the, the Burns unit. And he's actually been to my house and collected the checks, so that was special as well. Um, and then alongside that, my wife, Lindsay, she ran the uh, Leeds Half Marathon and to raise even more funds and I think with other little things uh, along the side we, we had other events um, where we sold prints and box canvases and we, I think we got up to about five grand uh, by the time we'd finished so that was but the energy behind it it took a lot out when we did that and uh, maybe didn't think so at the time but people have asked again will you do anything in the future and I, I, I probably will do but it's uh, the energy and the emotion behind that whole, the whole thing was um, I wouldn't say it was traumatic um, because it was a nice thing to do, but it, it brought a lot of things back. Um, but I was just so glad to help people and you know, the ongoing work from the Burns unit they're doing, you know, they, they rely on donations and they get no money from the government, so it's solely a charitable based um organization. So, anyone that wants to donate to the Burns unit, feel, please feel free and contact them because I should, I think, they'll be uh, really happy that, that that's uh, forthcoming. And um, just the one last thing, and if you could say to the 15-year-old Paul Town that was in the stadium that day, something, what would it be? Um, what would I say to Paul Town? Think about those that were less lucky on the day and just live your life to the full. I appreciate your time, mate. Thank you so much. Take Have care, Bob. Thank you, mate. I'll stop the recording. <laughs>